my name is Justin Bright and welcome to Kerbal Space Program version 1.10.1 in my next small step RP1 career mode playthrough. And so here we are uh, with the Mars Exploration System. Uh, we finished up getting a whole bunch of science on board in the last episode and now it's time to take it home or at least give it the old college try. Um, I wonder which one of these is actually Kurt, uh, Earth. There it is, Earth and the Moon, off in this direction we can see as larger spots on the sky thanks to distant object enhancement. Uh, but yes, we are about, uh, let's actually turn this back on, I like having this on. Or debris, that seems fine, there we go. Neat. Uh, so in any case, we are here with the Mars Exploration System, we are about 12 hours away from our uh, burn out to uh, Earth once again. So, let's take a look at uh, how we're doing so far. All right, so here we are with our transfer in. Uh, it looks like we are actually going to sail past the moon very briefly, uh, which shouldn't cause too much trouble, shouldn't. Um, but that should get us to where we want to be. I don't want to tweak this too much because it's not really going to matter. Uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of what we're looking for. Uh, I had to re-up this node because it kind of fell apart for whatever reason. But yeah, this is this is what we're looking for right now. It's only going to cost us a little bit more than 2,000 meters per second, which is great uh, and very good to know. And the node is in about 19 hours. So uh, in re-upping this, it did shift that out a little bit. That said, there's really nothing else to be done here. So the Mars Exploration System, uh, as you recall, we brought this out to... Um, really hold on a second, remove... Oh shoot, I didn't mean to remove the nodes. Darn it, I just wanted to abort my execution. Uh, because we don't actually need this, uh, this mast anymore. So I guess I could take it with us, but... Um, well, there's no real harm in taking it with us, but we can remove this and... Uh, get back the delta v that this this is allowing us to have and off it goes it does not have uh, sufficient avionics and it is off and away look at this just traveling off into the galaxy <laughs> sorry i don't know i don't know why that amused me so much um anyways so that's that uh now we just have this and you can see that we have our just our avionics our parachute and then the lunar rated heat shield on the bottom uh, because i'm intending to just slam directly into the atmosphere from an interplanetary trajectory and hope everything works out fine um and this is going to give us a little bit more delta v to play with as far as um because i shed a little bit of mass it's going to give us just the, that much more delta v to break into the uh uh, sphere of influence of earth uh, i'm not going to try to capture into an orbit because i don't have the delta v for it but i will be able to slow down a bit to make things easier on our um return capsule so uh let's just make sure yep everything's up there that's good uh so yeah that's all there is to it so let's go ahead and get this node again again and then we will be on our way all right here we go preparing for our final transit away from mars uh, after doing a tremendous amount of science uh, so as a little uh, recap for this um, for this vessel uh, this was a um, I mean, you better not be doing that thing I'm watching you see it's doing that thing again where I had 3600 meters per second and it's telling me that I'm, I don't have enough and I don't know why I have no idea if I should be worried, if I shouldn't be worried. Anyways, um, so this vessel was a, um, it was that first set of lander, rover, and return capsule that I tried to send out, but I failed to actually land uh, two of those, most of that actually, like most of the, um, oh, sorry, uh, lander, return capsule, rover, and um, uh, communication satellites. That's why it had that little mast on the end there. Uh, and so it was able to use those to, um, see, it just changed a bunch, and now it seems like it's fine. I have no idea what's happening here. Um, but yeah, I dropped off communication satellites in the orbit of Mars, um, and I also, uh, uh, did get some landing stuff and did get a rover, uh, sort of kind of down, but we didn't actually manage to succeed on most of those, but, um, uh, we did do some stuff and we were able to grab a whole bunch of science from various bodies as we were uh, on our way back. So that is just fabulous and wonderful. Um, 
but yeah, so this has been, uh, like, if I manage to nail this, then this is going to have been uh, the, a real big marker of success for this particular mission. Um, uh, and that's good, because this is one of those um, combo mission type things. Like, I actually assembled this thing in orbit, uh, which was not super easy to do, but um, it wasn't it wasn't too bad. Uh, but having done that, um, that is good practice for where we're going in the future. All right, so just double check in our uh, final orbit here. So let's just do that with uh, caps lock on to make this a little bit less harrowing. And there we go. Sure, that seems fine. And then we'll be able to fix that once we get into the sphere of influence of Earth. And we are so we are on our way home, and it is going to take us. So in 294 or 295 days, we are going to arrive back home uh, into the sphere of influence of Earth. Um, we should, in theory, have everything that we need for that. We'll call this the return bus and we'll call this a, I don't know, a lander? Probe is fine. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's really all there is to it. Um, so in that amount of time, we should be back home, and then I will have to figure out if I'm going to be able to uh, re-enter safely. All right, we are rejoining the Tedris 1-3 satellite, which is going to be um, inserting into its final orbit around Earth, and then we will be able to uh, play with all of the fun uh, radar or satellite dishes. Uh, that are all on board here uh, so that we can finally uh, tune our um, communications network because it's a little bit easier to understand once I show you. Uh, so um, as before we are just now getting into our our orbit which is looking pretty good. We are not too far from it. Um, like, a, uh, as I mentioned before, we are slightly inclined, but that doesn't really matter. What matters is making sure your orbital period is as uh, consistent as possible. And there we have that. So 23, 56, 4.1 is what we're looking for. So we'll just do 23, 56, 4, and then we'll point towards the sun. And now that we have 100% exposure, we just kill rotation, and now we can manipulate our orbit to our hearts, our, our hearts content. All right, there it is, 23, 4.10 seconds. Uh, boom, so that's that's what we're looking for. Um, and we're just, I'm just turning this off. Uh, the unfortunate thing is once I uh, go back to the other satellites, I'm going to have to do this uh, again, uh, but it's not, it's not so bad, especially when you have, um, RCS that is as uh, light as I have here. You see, I only on on my uh, satellite bus, I only included two uh, thrusters for forward and back, which makes it even easier to very finely tune your um, uh, your location. Uh, so, just like with before, uh, we are going to now uh, tune in our satellites. Uh, we can do most of this. I am going to have to visit each one one more time after this, now that I think about it, so there's not really a big point to in doing this um, this time. But what we can do is I can kind of show you what I'm talking about, because I'm just kind of mumbling at this point. Okay, I had to save and reload for some reason, but uh, now we have the antenna targeting open. Uh, so yeah, just like we did before, I want to show the vessels and I want to get down to... I think my process of elimination, there's only one left here, but it's Canberra that we are pointing at. And there we go, now we are pointing properly at the correct uh, ground station. So we got one pointing at Madrid, one pointing at Goldstone, one now pointing at Canberra. And so we have that lovely high um, transmission rate. Uh, and so the other things that I can do is I can take one of these and point this at Idris 1-2. And I can take this one over here and point it at Idris 1-1. And so when they're pointed at each other, 
as you can see now that we're just like pointed off in various directions like that but if it was pointed back then we would have a connection and that would allow me to relay a signal in case for whatever reason uh, you couldn't actually um, see a particular ground station so this uh, at least my experience with doing this comes from and it drives me nuts that this does not see it, it's not uh perfectly symmetrical because this is not pointing straight down <laughs> uh, but that's once again because i did not put it in a particular place i just put it uh, up into a random geostationary orbit knowing that it would be roughly above one of the ground stations probably uh, and it was and everything is wonderful so uh when I played with remote tech uh, a while back, um, I, I used to use that pretty consistently, but the way that it worked, at least the way it worked a while ago, so please take this with a grain of salt if this is something that's changed since then, I haven't used it in years. Uh, but you would have the ground station at um, uh, the Kerbal Space Center was the only place. It was the only ground center. And so there was none of these uh, million of ground centers on the ground here, weak or no, there was nothing. And so the only way that you could get any kind of communication was to put up a uh, communication network kind of like this one, where um, you would have one that was directly above the Kerbal Space Center. Uh, and so it was going, pointing straight down to get you that communication. And then you would have uh, the two in the other orbit. So if you imagine that I am now in that orbit directly above the Kerbal Space Center, then there was these two here and I would link up to these and this one would link up to this one and to this one. And then they would have uh, Omni antennas that would give them just a sphere of influence basically around them that uh, they could communicate in which they could communicate and that was how you would do communications at least uh, near earth communications uh, with remote tech back in the day uh, like I said I have no idea if that's still how that works but that is the memory that is coming to me <laughs> as I do this and have to point the individual antennas at each other uh, so um, that is that um, the last antenna on here is saved for the Vizalt 3 which has not launched yet but once that launches um, then I can go through each of these uh, do the 1-1 and the 1-2 and this one too as well I guess uh, because it's also going to need to point at the um, uh, the result three um, and then I will be able to get those communications and we will have a lot of really good um, data that we're able to get down at the full transmission rate of 148 kilobytes per second <sighs> so that is a lot of work for one science experiment but to be perfectly fair it's a really good science experiment <laughs> Uh, so these missions are have been very successful for now. Uh, I'm looking forward to finishing that up very soon. All right, it is finally time. You can see that it is the dawn of August 20th, 1977, the launch day for Voyager 2. So we are launching at the exact same day uh, up into the plane of the moon, uh, which is what I kind of hope the actual trajectory was, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, but we are ignited and off the pad with our two heavy uh, UA-1205 rockets that is bringing us up towards a good orbit and bringing this spacecraft hopefully out on its mission of a grand tour. Uh, yes, indeed. Voyager 1, Voyager 2, finally it is time. Uh, I have been uh, having people remind me about this launch date for, gosh, a long time. Months, real life months. People have been uh, letting me know that um, this, this launch is coming and that I should absolutely do something about it. Uh, and I agree. I think that's a great idea because this is just a fantastic... Um, ship that is not rotating in any way I have control right I mean right, you're being weird oh. all right whatever uh, hopefully it doesn't break um, anyways, uh, it's been something that has been incredibly long anticipated, and I have been very excited to launch myself. Uh, I have put together a uh, bus that is not like, I'm not trying to duplicate the, um, 
uh, the exact parameters of the spacecraft because there's all that sort of stuff. But what I've basically done is I've waited until the absolute last minute as far as uh, how long I could wait to get all the science stuff that I needed. And then I built this mission once I had unlocked that last node on the science tech tree and uh, packed this thing with all the latest and greatest long range exploration science that we can uh, put together uh, for our for this mission. So this should be able to get us a tremendous amount of science. Um, but in the uh, spirit of Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, uh, I am launching these on the exact days and then I'm going to just do what I can to find what the actual trajectories are. Um, what I do know is that Voyager 2 was launched uh, first um, and we have separation on our boosters and ignition on the uh, LR87. Voyager 2 was launched first because it was actually sent off in a slightly slower trajectory that would uh, take it out to Jupiter. Um, because the, the, the destination of both of these rockets in the first uh, instance was Jupiter. Um, but Voyager 2 was on its way out there uh, on a slower trajectory so that it would have more favorable, favorable conditions for its further mission, which was to also hit uh, Neptune and Uranus, which um, Voyager 1 uh, did not do. Voyager 1 uh, went out there a little bit on a shorter trajectory, went, th went out there a little bit faster, uh, and actually would get to Jupiter first, which is why it was called Voyager 1 and not Voyager 2, even though it was launched uh, a little more, a little bit more than two weeks later. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's uh, the reason why Voyager 2 comes first in the launch order, but uh, I'm going to try my best to follow the, um, all of that a little bit, like the, uh, the way that, um, or the mission profiles uh, to try to make Voyager 2 to be the big grand tour mission that hits um, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, while uh, um, Voyager 1, the mission is going to be Jupiter and uh, Saturn and Titan, um, or Pluto. Allegedly, um, Voyager 1 could have hit Pluto if it did not hit Titan. Um, so I guess I'll see what kind of fun things that I can get as a stretch goal for that one because I've already basically done that mission with one of my Pioneer uh, spacecraft. Um, it's already gone out there and done Jupiter, uh, Saturn, and then I think Neptune? I'm not sure if it was able to hit Uranus, but it definitely Neptune. Um, and, but anyways, it still hasn't even gotten there yet. Like, Pioneer Jupiter is still two and a half months away from arriving, um, and I'm launching now the Voyager missions. <laughs> it just goes to show how far out this stuff is. Uh, all right, so we are just a couple seconds away from firing up our uh, upper stage. There we go, we got that, and should be the fairing coming off here any second now as well. Um, but yeah, we are on our way up. Everything is working out so far. I am pretty thrilled about that. There we go. Fairing is separated and you can see, see the spacecraft now, which is using my big level seven X-band dish and all kinds of big um, uh, RTGs because I didn't have quite the right flavor of RTG, but this is what I had available now and that was going to be ready on the launch day, which is way more important than, um, having the best possible stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, I'm super excited about that. Um, this is, like I said, it's based on Voyager 2 pretty pretty closely, um, mostly just in that I, it's kind of vaguely shaped the same, where it has the big dish on the front and then the little golden bus, and then all kinds of science experiments and RTGs hanging off the sides. Uh, I also include a big toroidal tank on the bottom there, uh, and a uh, 0.4 kilonewton um, generic thruster on the back, which is going to give us um, um, the oomph that we need to uh, adjust our, our trajectory on the way because um, I'm not sure, well, I know I'm not going to be able to spend the time that I need to to um, uh, dial in the trajectory absolutely perfectly given patch conics, uh, the nature of KSP, and also my own um, uh, not wanting to fiddle that much. <laughs> uh, so we're going we're gonna to have a nice engine on there that's going to help us to... Um, uh, not just point the spacecraft because we don't need to point the spacecraft, but we will have the extra delta V to make maneuvers a little bit better, uh, add a little gas on if we need uh, to make sure that we hit all of our objectives and targets.
So yeah, the Voyager spacecraft um, are some of the more uh, famous spacecraft that we have out in orbit, one of the most famous space probes that we've, we've ever sent. Uh, it's currently out in interplanetary space. Um, both of them now, I think, are now uh, outside of the official bounds of the solar system, which is super cool. Um, so uh, I have no idea. Uh, I I, I'm pretty sure we're not going to be running this mission for running this series for the next 43 in-game years, um, but I might time warp ahead to see where things end up to see if there is anything fun on the outside of the solar system. I don't think there's any even like, I, why are you freaking out so much? My goodness. Um, I'm not even sure that there's anything like, no, there's no boundary to the solar system really, but just because of the limits, limitations of Kerbal Space Program, but um, uh, so I don't think there's anything actually really exciting out there, but um, it should be fun anyways to, to see this mission through, if nothing else. All right, we are still wiggling vigorously. I'm, I, I hate it. I really don't like that that's happening. I don't know why that's happening. I wonder if there's some kind of imbalance or if I just need to save and load. I have no idea. Uh, but yeah, so you'll see that we are going to be left once we finally get into orbit with a little bit more than 8,000 meters per second of delta V. This number is dropping precipitously for reasons I do not understand, probably because of all the wiggling. Oh, it's just like not guiding me at all. Maybe reset the guidance? Oh yeah, it's totally broke. Neato. All right, don't mind the reload there. Something was terribly bugged out, but uh, we seem to be working working well now. Um, I also managed to not have um, Aerozine and NTO on the avionics, but I can pull from the main tanks of the spacecraft itself to do what little turning we need to, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, but you can see that we have been left with a massive 8,700 meters per second of delta V, um, which is going to give us uh, the opportunity to really get the heck out there. Here we go. We are now going to start our uh, trajectory. So we have lots of options here. And if I just take the absolute shortest, um, the shortest path is not what we're looking for. We're actually looking for something. This is the launch window for uh, the second vessel, but we are up here. So yeah, this is kind of an option where we have a um, big transfer out to, out to Saturn. And that gets us that gets us there, but um, yeah, this is not this is not optimal, and this is actually something that's probably going to take a little while of tweaking and fiddling for me to find the right transfer. But I'm we launched on the right day, so I'm confident that we will find our correct trajectory. Uh, we have tons of delta v. We have a little spacecraft that is ready to do it, and I will talk more about that later on. But that is actually all the time I have here. I'm going to leave you all on a cliffhanger watching this craft be ready to make its final transfer out towards Jupiter and the outer solar system to do a flyby grand tour of the solar system with its twin ship that is going to be uh, exploring uh, more quickly the different gas giants of the so deep solar system. If you enjoyed this episode, please let me know what you think down in the comments below. Like and subscribe, and I will see you next time.